Cool. Well, I think I'll, I'll get started now. Um, looks like the numbers have kind of leveled off. Um, I always love to hear what, what people are seeing since we're all over the state and in other states too. So it's kind of cool just to it's springtime to hear what's showing up and what's um, on the way. So, um, so thanks for sharing. Um, I did, I did pull together a, a short presentation um, here. One second, I'm going to mute, I'm going to mute everyone real quick. Um, there we go. Get rid of some background noise. So um, I did, I did put together a, a, a presentation um, going over some of the, the early breeding species that you can actually find now this time of year. Um, and then I wanted to show um, a couple of updates. Probably most of you have already encountered these updates with the app, um, the eBird mobile app, but um, the, there are some nice changes that have come come through. and. Um, I think they'll they'll make things a lot easier for for this season. So I just wanted to show those really briefly too, um, and then hopefully we'll have have some time for for questions as well. Um, and so as I'm going through this presentation, if you have questions, please um, please put them in the in the chat, and I will I will get to them. Let's see here. I want which desktop? Desktop one. Sorry. Multiple monitors. Okay. Can you see that presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so I wanted to talk about, there's, there's about 30 species, 30 plus species that are actually like, that we can actually like confirm breeding early in the season, um, before a lot of the birds are even back. Um, so I just wanted to go over them. Um, and I've always loved this photo. I've seen it pop up here and there over the years. And, um, it's just this like, <laughs> really tenacious bald eagle sitting on the, her nest. Um, even so though... we're actually seeing the, sorry, the presenter view, not the slideshow view. We're oh. seeing notes and such too, yeah. Oh, thank you, Anne. Yeah, no worries, done that more than once. Swap displays, how's that? Is that better? That works, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so this is just a, um, a, I think, a funny picture of some really tenacious um, uh, bald eagles on the nest. Um, so first, general atlasing tips, and I think that these pretty much go throughout the whole season, but um, particularly this time of year when we're not necessarily thinking about breeding birds, it's really good to keep an eye out for any sort of um, courtship displays. Um, carrying nesting material and nest building. Um, and then it's also really helpful to pay attention to the actual breeding range and habitat. So, um, you know, it's just so that you're aware of when and where to expect certain species to be. Um, and I put in here a couple of tips on where you can go to find some of this information. So this is basically a collection of the resources that I use really frequently when I'm trying to answer lots of people's questions because I don't know everything. Um, so, so I'm constantly referencing all of all of these sources. So, for range map, I think it's it's really helpful to helpful to use the Atlas website or even just going to eBird. Um, and then for habitat. Um, there's some really good descriptions in both All About Birds and also in the Audubon um, Bird Guide. If you haven't checked that out, that's actually a, a good resource as well. Um, and then also this time of year, it's helpful to learn the songs and calls and to start preparing your brain to be thinking about juveniles because some of the, um, the, you know, the raptors will be hearing those juveniles while a lot of our songbirds are returning. So just kind of getting getting your ear tuned again 
Um, and I generally use both the Merlin and the Audubon app. Um, but if you ever have any questions about whether it's a song or a call, um, I do find that the Merlin app is really pretty spot on. If it says it's a song, then you can mark that as a song. And if it says it's a call, then it's probably a, a call. And you can um, enter that as just a, with an H, meaning it's in the appropriate habitat. Um, there are some more resources too, so like Macaulay Library and Xenocanto, if you're really into sound, um, sound things. Um, oh, and also the, um, forgot to add on here, the new resource for the Peterson's guide from uh, Nathan Pipolo um, has, is also a great resource for, for learning the songs and calls. And that actually has all the sonograms on there as well. Um, and then the last thing, which I find to be the, the most interesting part is really trying to learn about courtship behavior. So like, is this, is this behavior that I'm observing, is this part of courtship or are they being aggressive or like, what, what is the purpose of what they're doing? And like, or are they just kind of like being a little weird? Um, and so <laughs> I find that part of atlasing to be really, really fun. Um, and so I, I often reference, you know, all about birds. Um, there's an older resource, a couple of older resources called uh, Birds by Bent, Arthur Bent, um, and also some books by the Stokes um, that came out, I think in the 90s, um, that have quite a bit of good information. Some of the information is a little outdated because we've learned more about the context in which some of the behaviors are performed, but it does go through and describe a lot of the behaviors that you'll see. Um, and then if, um, if you're fortunate enough to have access to Birds of the World, that's kind of like the definitive um, resource for a lot of behaviors and phenology and habitat preferences, food preferences. That one does cost a little bit of money, um, but you get a, um, you do get a discount if you're using eBird all the time. Um, so just be aware of that, that there is a, a small discount for Birds of the World if you're interested in um, purchasing that. It's, it is definitely like worth the money, I think, if you're atlasing and want to learn more about these behaviors. Okay, so um, diving into some of the species, obviously owls, this is the time of year for owls, particularly April. So the great horned owls that, you know, they start courting, doing their duetting, even in November, November, December, January. Um, but by April, they start to have their, their juveniles. And then in April, you're also starting to get a lot more of the other owl species that are being more active. Um, so April's kind of a good, like, if you want to like target a lot of your nocturnal surveys to one, you know, a shorter time of year when it's not quite so cold out, um, April is a good month to do that because that is when you can get the, the young great horns and then the, the courting, um, like barred owls and, and, um, screech owls and stuff. So I do think that with owls, it's really helpful to learn, you know, not just the sounds of the adults and, and the duets and the, the duets are when both the male and the female are calling at the same time or back and forth to each other. And that's part of their courtship. Um, but in addition to that, it's really helpful to learn the, the sounds of the young because that's where um, you'll actually have a chance to, to track down a nest. Um, and that's, that's always exciting because the uh, young owls are super cute. Um, if you're going to do nocturnal surveys, um, it's, it's helpful to start just a little bit before, before sunset. And, and generally the first half of the night is, is when a lot of the species are more active. Um, and then obviously targeting, you know, clear moonlit nights when there's not as much wind. Um, and that'll allow, the, the birds tend to be a little more active when it's moonlit night, because um, they can see better for hunting. Um, and then you don't want wind because it'll be hard to hear. Um, and then if you're in good habitat for any owl species, um, 
a good trick to do or a good strategy um, is to drive on, you know, slower, slower traffic roads where there's not as much traffic. So it'll be a little safer to pull off on the side of the road and then stop like every mile or so and listen for a few minutes. And don't, you know, don't sit there for like 15 minutes. If you haven't heard anything within the first few minutes, move on to the next spot. Um, because they, um, if they're calling, then you're likely to hear them and you can hear them for quite a lot, quite a distance. So, um, yeah. And then, um, we do ask that if you go out owling and you don't hear any owls, you don't hear any birds, still make a checklist for that, um, that visit because um, that counts as atlasing effort. Um, so you just, you just basically make an empty checklist. It'll still have the, the date and the start time and everything. If you want to put a comment in the, in the notes saying, oh, I went owling, but didn't hear anything, that's fine. Um, you don't have to, but, um, yeah, so, so we do encourage you to do that, even though it seems a little silly, um, because it does count as, as atlasing effort. So, so great horns um, tend to prefer a little bit more open habitat. Um, so they kind of like, you know, nest in the trees, but then they're like to have adjacent open areas to forage in. Um, and they don't build their own nest. So they're only reusing nests that from like usually red-tailed hawks, but other hawk species, other owls um, and, and those things. And then also cavities as well. Um, and then, um, as I already mentioned, they're likely, probably most of the duetting is, is over with for this year, um, but pretty soon we'll start hearing the young birds. Um, and one thing to, to note with owls is that um, we really don't want to disturb them. We want to keep our distance and and not um, make them feel threatened. Um, so this picture here is a picture of a young great horned owl and it, it looks really cool. It's like this really cool posture. It's very impressive. Um, but what this, this owl is doing is trying to make itself look super big and, and imposing so that um, whatever is scaring it will, will go away. So if you do see that behavior, that probably means that you're a little bit too close and you should, you should back off. So barred owls, um, I know people have been starting to see them and hear them courting. Um, this is one of the species that you can get during the daytime as well. They're kind of active all, all the time. Um, and, and sometimes um, you'll just encounter them while you're out doing your normal atlasing. Um, and for these species, um, it's kind of good to know, like if you have a block and you have a great horned owl in it, most likely you're not gonna have a barred owl near that great horned owl. And that that is because of this. So this is um, a photo or a snapshot I took from um, a YouTube video that uh, actually Cornell Lab sent out today in one of their emails. Um, and this is a great horned owl nest that the adult is up in the, the top right corner. Um, and then here's the baby. And, um, and then this is an adult barred owl. So the great horned owls will, will prey on the barred owl. So that's why you tend to get them um, not occurring in the same areas. But then screech owls, on the other hand, are prey of barred owls. So if you have a barred owl, you're probably not going to have a screech owl. So we kind of tend to get like great horns and screech owls in one area and bards in another. So they kind of, that's, that's kind of how you'll see them placed on the landscape. So just something to, to keep an eye out on. They are a little bit more vocal and, and whatnot, but again, if you're trying to maximize your efficiency, um, going out in that first half of the night to try to get owls is probably your best bet. All right, raptors, um, 
so much courtship going on right now with raptors. Um, a lot of these raptors um, are right now doing their um, their courtship flights where the pair is like flying together really closely or they're doing these, you know, food drops for each other um, and, and that kind of stuff. And then um, they're young, later in the season, their young are, are pretty noisy. So if you learn the young sounds, you'll be able to like look for the nest and you'll look for that whitewash on the tree. So the white on the tree is really from, you know, them uh, defecating. The young birds are defecating from the nest and it kind of drops down on the tree um, and on the branches below it. And so it's like a, a, a big cue to be like, ah, oh, there's a, a raptor nest somewhere hidden in that tree. Um, and then often, yeah, you'll get the, these little, um, all the little passerines are going to be agitated if you, um, are near, if, sorry, if there is one nearby. Um, so listen for the alarm calls of like chickadees and vireos and blue jays, and those will alert you to where there could be a nest nearby. Bald eagles are, have increased their range throughout the state. There's a lot more of them. There's hundreds of nests in the state now, um, but there are still new nests being found. Um, so there's, you know, still a chance that you'll find a, a nest that hasn't been documented yet. Um, so the best way to look for them, uh, you know, they're, they're a really large bird, but they're often nesting in those really tall uh, white pine trees that are sticking out of the forest. So keep an eye out for those um, and, uh, and just document them anytime you see one um, because you never know, it might be one that, that's not already in the atlas. Goshawks, we do not have very many goshawks in the atlas yet. Um, so this is a, a fairly widespread species in the state, but it's, um, you know, very low density and they like these really large patches of mature forest that have a little bit of um, an open understory so they can fly around a bit more. Um, and, you know, they're, they're known for attacking people, they get too close to their nest. Um, but that being said, it, I, it's probably um, doesn't happen that often, right? So um, it's really a matter of, I think for this atlas, we're gonna have to go out of our way to actually find these birds to search for them in some of these uh, larger forest areas. Um, and, then, and then listening for the, the alarm call of, the, of these species. Peregrine falcons are also expanding their range. Um, they're, um, you know, we, we've got lots of them in, in the cities, um, but they're also starting to um, return to natural nest sites as well. So cliffs all across the state. Um, they do some elaborate uh, courtship displays, like the male will do like a big figure eight display in, in flight. Um, so for these birds, I would say, you know, anytime you see one, try to watch it until you see where it lands. Um, and then if you can, you know, have a scope or, or just try to get closer to that spot and, and keep an eye on that area and see, see if you've actually got a nesting pair there. Um, cause these are still being found in new places around the state as well. Um, just in the, the last living bird, um, that came out in the in the fall. There was a, a really nice article uh, by some folks at Cornell that documented the first uh, peregrine falcon to nest in the Tiganic State Park. First time they had been there since I want to say the 50s, um, when Arthur Allen had first documented them there, and then they disappeared, and and now they they just finally returned um, two summers ago. So. Um, these, these birds have actually been um, observed by a lot of people now. They're kind of like 
an exciting find for people in the Ithaca area. Red-tailed hawk, um, kind of uh, well, similar to uh, great horned owl habitat, you know, these um, forest edges and um, they like to have these open areas in order to, to forage. They'll be doing all the, the courtship flights right now. You might see them carrying sticks to their nest and um, carrying food and bringing it to their mates and kind of showing off. Um, and then later in the season, like the other raptors, you'll, you'll be able to find them by listening for the begging young. Game birds. So we do have a lot of um, species like grouse and woodcock and turkey. Um, and I find these species to be like the best time to find them is either during courtship or when they have their babies because they tend to be um, really aggressive and doing a lot of distraction displays if they're young or nearby. So, so that those are kind of the two best periods to, to get these game birds. So I know last night my phone was kind of ringing off the hook because there were tons of um, woodcocks that had just showed up and were starting to do their courtship flight around Albany. Um, just last night, they're just showing up in mass. So um, we had one in our backyard even. So, um, so they're back and they're doing their thing. And um, yeah, it's time to, to get out there and document those guys. Um, rough grouse are also starting to drum. Um, these are, I find like a really difficult species to target. If you're looking for them, I feel like they're kind of like encounter them by accident. Like you're in a forest and you just find them by driving some back dirt road or while you're hiking on some, some trail. Um, and then, and then you'll flush them and the, the, the mothers will get, extremely aggressive and, um, and, and make all kinds of noise and flying and squealing and, and stuff like that if, if they have young nearby. Spruce grouse, there's not that many um, left in, in New York anymore, but they are, there are a few um, and they're in these really remote, larger spruce bogs in the Adirondacks. Um, pretty soon, and so in a couple of weeks is when we'll kind of be hitting their, their peak of their courtship. Um, and it's, it's really good to, to try to get familiar with their, um, their courtship display. So the males do this very elaborate courtship display. They'll be up in the trees and they'll be moving their head around doing like what they call head banging, um, making kinds of little tail flicks and little noises. Um, so it, and I've encountered them before doing their courtship. And if I wasn't like paying attention and looking for spruce grouse, I think I would have totally walked right by them doing their courtship because they were like up in a tree, a little off the trail. Um, and it's pretty quiet sounds that they make. And so um, you kind of have to be on the alert for them and just um, be familiar with what they actually do for courtship. Um, and then the, the young um, are most likely around in June and through August. So in those um, spruce bogs, they do take their young a little bit higher up. So up into the uplands um, once they're old enough to move away from the nest. Um, so you're not going to get them down deep in the bogs when they have their young, they'll be up a little bit in the drier areas. Um, woodcock, um, most of us are familiar with these guys. They have this really elaborate flight display. They make these funny little beep sounds and they do this twittering flight and they go up in a big circle and then twitter back down and um, it's like just a really entertaining and um, spectacular thing to see. Um, so anywhere that you see like an abandoned field that has a lot of aspens nearby or other like early successional forest, that's a good place to go out and listen for them um, right at dusk. 
um, that's that's their peak time. And then um, and listen for the the little peints and the, that twittering sound. You often don't see them very well, but you'll hear them. Turkey, I feel like we're always running into turkey. Um, whenever you're like driving on the road, sometimes they show up in my backyard. They'll do like their the males will even court your your vehicle if they see their reflection in your like in the side of your car or something. Um, so I feel like they're um, pretty well covered in the atlas. But if you do see them, um, often it's like while you're driving down the road or something, might not be while you're actually atlasing. Um, you can just enter an incidental checklist that you had courting turkeys, um, and that'll help us fill in some, some good gaps for, for these species. So corvids, that's another group that's really busy right now. Um, first thing to, to make note of is that um, you know, fish crows are expanding throughout the state quite a bit. So it's good to just make sure that you don't always assume um, that, you know, if you see a crow, don't always just assume that it's an American crow, depending on where you are in the state. Um, it could be a fish crow. So um, that's, that's one thing I'll note there. But um, some of the species, so like ravens do have a bit of courtship. Um, and you'll see them doing this paired flight, just like you will with hawks. Um, but other species don't do as much courtship, um, but you will see them like sitting in a tree together and they'll be preening each other. Um, and so that's, that's kind of what they do to, to um, strengthen their, their pair bond with their mate. Um, a good time to look for them is now when they're actually building their nest. Um, last weekend, when we were in the Adirondacks, we saw ravens carrying billfuls of moss. Um, so they're they're building right now, um, and then they tend to have all the corvid species tend to have very noisy young because they're begging and they're active and they're just making tons of sound, asking for food. Canada jays, believe it or not, nest now, even when there's still snow on the ground. Um, they're able to, to survive and feed their young somehow. Seems kind of miraculous, but they, they're they quite successful. Um, Canada jays are, you know, in the, the boreal forest. Um, a lot of Canada jay locations are pretty well known in the state, but if you think you're in good habitat, it's just a good idea to like make some whistles um, and then keep an eye in all directions around you, behind you, above you, because um, you never know. They, they kind of come out of nowhere and they don't make much sound when they first approach. Um, so they can, they can surprise you. Um, and then, you know, in some places they'll just, they'll come in and find you. They're, they're very tame and they love to have nuts and, and other human food, so. Um, ravens are pretty conspicuous nests. They'll make these huge nests um, in, in pretty high places. Um, they do have uh, these pretty noisy flight displays. You know, it's always fun to watch them on uh, when they're courting. Um, and they'll be doing lots of flips and turns and, and things like that. And they, they do have some very noisy young. So American crow, that's one of the species that doesn't do a whole lot of courtship. Um, but but you will find them paired up in trees next to each other, and they they will preen each other, um, and then and then they do bring their young into open areas to feed them, and that's kind of in contrast to fish crows, which um, they will take their young actually and take them away from the nest right away and keep them in a little bit more secluded areas away from people. Um, Fish crows do nest a little bit later than American crow, and they don't really have much courtship. So it's it's really the best time to, to see them is when they're carrying nesting material. 
Um, one thing to note is that the American crows, um, the females, when they're sitting on the nest, have a very nasally call note that they make. Um, and it's very can sound very similar to a fish crow. Um, so that's um, just something to be aware of. If you're in an area where there's both species, um, you might want to just take a little bit closer attention to to those species to the birds and see um, whether it's a fish or an American. All right, cavity nesters. Oh my God, all these cavity nesters. A lot of them come to our feeders and they are just going crazy right now. There's tons of chasing, there's fighting, there's courting, there's um, just tons and tons of energy going on right now with a lot of these, these species. So, um, so now is the time to get them. Um, they're resident birds, they're here already, they're on territory, they keep their territory year round. Um, so they're just kind of ready to go as soon as things thaw out. Um, there's some of these species make some pretty elaborate courtship rituals. Um, and so that can be um, a, a good way to, to get some breeding evidence for them. Uh, and then they make, uh, a lot, the young often make a lot of noise when they're inside the cavities. Um, so as soon as they're born, you'll hear lots of these like chattering coming from, from the trees. Um, and that's the young better begging for food. So some of these species are this, the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, and they do quite a lot of courtship displays. They'll be tapping on the trees together. They'll be chasing each other around, like playing kind of like hide and seek on each side of the trunk together. Sometimes the females will even mount the males instead of the males mounting the females. Um, they can be quite aggressive and fighting each other as well. Both of the nut hatches, I find these guys to be kind of hard to confirm in a way because they're most active now in March and April. Now is when they're building their, their courting and they're building their nests. And then once they have their, once they're on eggs and they have young, they can be a lot quieter and a lot harder to find them. Um, and then it's a lot harder to just to get any breeding behaviors on them. Um, so, so now is really a great time to get, to get both not have species. So with white breasteds, um, you know, they're in more your deciduous forest and your red breasteds are in those, uh, spruce fir, um, more coniferous forests. Chickadees, they're so adorable. Um, they're also cavity nesters, believe it or not. They have these tiny little bills, but they're they're still building, making holes and, and making their nests in cavities. Um, they can be quite, um, what do I wanna say, distracted or single-minded. So when they're actually building their nest, they, they don't seem to care if there's people nearby. They just are so like into what they're doing that they just go and go and go and build their nest. Um, and then once the the young have fledged, um, it's kind of hard to, to miss the little family groups because the young are super active and they're calling a lot and they're in the trees and they're moving around and the adults are kind of frantically moving around trying to feed them. And so you, you'll be walking along and then you'll just run into like this cluster of, um, of black cap chickadees and, and um, usually there'll be like three babies or more and, and both adults frantically trying to, to feed them. So they're a little bit easier than the nut hatches, I find. I'm actually going to skip through these guys, these um, the city slickers. These are kind of you know the species that we often overlook. So you got your rock pigeons, which everyone knows they're like under every bridge. Um, morning doves. Right now, there um, there's a lot of courtship going on with them. Um, they do, the males will just like chase the females. So you'll see, 
if you have feeders, like the male will just be running after the female all the time. And then he'll follow her to this branch and this branch and this branch. So that is part of their courtship. It's called chasing. Um, and they're breeding throughout the summer. So um, they're starting now and they'll go in into August. I put this in the, the talk announcement to you. A lot of people don't realize that the males, some of the males can be distinguished from the females because um, they have a little bit larger size. They have these, um, a little pinker breast, and then they have a lot more of the iridescent feathers on the neck there. Um, so if you start to look a little more closely at some of these morning doves, you'll be able to pick out the males and females and, and be able to find pairs a little bit more easily. House sparrows are basically breeding everywhere. Same with starlings. I do find that a lot of times um, newer birders aren't familiar with what a young starling looks like. Um, so if you're not familiar with young starlings, they look very different than an adult starling and they're just super drab gray birds, um, but they're super loud. And um, if you see the, the parents feeding them, the parents will basically like stick their head like way down the throat. So it's really amazing to watch them. <laughs> they're like voracious feed eaters. Um, monk parakeet um, is also seen in some of the, some of the cities around the state. Um, and you basically cannot miss their nests, their monstrosities, their huge, huge nests, and, and you really can't miss them. Um, but they're, they're nesting now as well. They'll be maintaining their nest throughout the year. So you might see them carrying sticks year round. Um, and you can, you can code that as carrying nesting material or even nest building if you see them like fitting it into their, their massive nests. All right, and then there's just a couple more that are breeding right now. Horned lark, um, Dan was asking about this before, um, before we got started. Um, this is one of our earliest breeders um, in terms of from the, the passerines. Um, and they like this open agricultural fields with you know little and short vegetation. Um, and it's, it's a good idea if you're in horned lark habitat to, to watch those, um, to just scan the field um, for a while to, to see if you can spot any of these birds. Um, they can be hard to see because they, they blend in with the, you know, the, the hills of the or the furrows from the agricultural, from the plows. Um, and then in, on Long Island, they're also found on in dunes as well. So it's just something if you're on Long Island, they do have a little bit different habitat preference down there, so. Cardinals, um, I think most of us are familiar with cardinals. Um, but they're they're courting right now as well. Um, both species, both yeah, both species, both sexes sing, um, and we do ask that you record any singing individual. Um, so whether it's a male or a female, or if you don't know what it is, you can still record a cardinal singing as singing, um, even though both sexes do sing. Um, and then in case you missed it, we had the, the crossbill training on Monday night, and I did put that um, recording up on YouTube. So that is up there now on our channel. Um, and we do cover not just the, the red and white winged crossbills, um, but also siskins in that. And, and we do cover how to identify the, the conifer trees and, and how to record the different um, call types for the, the red cross bill and um, go over the timing and all that stuff. So if you're interested in trying to find some of these winter finches, um, they are breeding now and um, they will have babies probably in the next two weeks or so. They'll start being a lot more babies showing up. Um, so it's um, 
it's a great time. This is a, probably the best year in the Atlas to, to try to confirm these breeding for, for the project. So, so if you're in an area with um, that's potential for, for these species, I, I do encourage you to, to go out and, um, and try to find them. And that is it for the early breeders. So let me, um, I'm gonna stop sharing real quick and look at some of the chat messages. And then, um, and then I'll show you a couple of um, things in the eBird app as well. Ooh, someone had tree swallows, awesome. Okay, everyone was telling me <laughs> that was in presenter view. <laughs> oh, nice. Cindy had um, saw it a couple of days ago in the Adirondacks too. Awesome. Yeah, playbacks for owls. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, we generally don't for the Atlas recommend doing a lot of playbacks just because it's harder, hard for people to know when they might be overusing it. Um, and in certain parts of the state, we really don't want people to be using playback, you know, like in the really densely populated areas like New York City, Long Island. There's already a lot of kind of harassment out there for any owl that shows up. Um, so I can't, I can't just uniformly recommend using playback. Playback is helpful for some of these owl species. Great horns tend not to be very um, responsive, but barred owls definitely are. Um, you know, that's that's one that even I can imitate and and get them to come in. So, um, but uh, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a difficult subject, but um, I do feel like there's just human population is growing so much and, and the state is becoming much more densely populated and lots more birders. And so um, ethically, it's hard to, to just unilaterally recommend that. Um, what I do plan to do is for the like technicians that we're hiring this summer um, is have them using more playback um, and doing targeted surveys also for rails and, and things like that, that, that we know are, um, are more responsive and easier to detect with playback. So, yeah. Yeah, Russell asks a good question. I'm not sure why they don't go for screech owls. I just kind of always assumed it was because it wasn't really worth the worth the energy. <laughs> um, I mean, screech owls are so much smaller. They're they're a little they're more agile, and then they're just a smaller prey item. They're mostly feathers. Um, that's what I've always thought. But if if somebody knows, like more I would be happy to happy to be corrected on that. Let's see. Uh, yes, Charlie, I think your males have a bluish cap, meaning the morning doves. Is that correct? Yeah. Yep, they do. Nesting red tails already, barred owls active, eagles, bluebirds already getting set up. Awesome. <laughs> Rails, when do they start nesting upstate? Not until end of April, May. I, I, I would say probably I wouldn't even target them until like mid-May. Yeah.
All right. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. So I know in general we're not supposed to count uh, dead birds um, for the atlas because you know they might not have died right there. But I had a situation where I was looking for crossbills gritting in the road, and I drove past an area, and then I like came back that same way, like less than half an hour later, and I found three dead crossbills in the road. Two were on the shoulder; they were still warm. One was in the snow a few feet off, and the two that were on the shoulders were fledglings, and it made me really, really, really sad. I almost like lost it, but um, yeah. so obviously they were killed like right there, and it is in a priority block where they're not confirmed in the Western Adirondacks. Um, could I count yeah. those as confirmed? Yeah. Um, yes, you can. You can count them as confirmed. And um, the the thing is, if you if on that checklist you didn't have any live birds, yeah. you just put a zero in for the number for the count, and then that will allow you to enter the code. Okay, I'll do that. So you don't count the dead birds as. Yeah like the number and i could i took pictures of them too i can upload the pictures i mean they're stripey they're little compared because the, the there was an adult male and two fledglings yeah um yeah. but yeah 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 so that's it's the kind of the same thing with like if you see a cowbird egg in a nest right like you don't actually see the cowbird there's no live cowbird but you know that it's like a nesting attempt of a cowbird. So you can enter zero for the cowbird and then enter the nest with eggs. So it's kind of that same scenario, but yeah, it's, it's really sad to see all these dead crossbill photos on eBird right now. There's a lot. Um, um, thanks Greg for clarifying. Yeah, mid-May is really when you wanna get out there start getting out there for the rails um and then mid-july for for finding the babies right and then the courtship is like in may and june so yeah just depending on which stage you're looking for um whoopsie i just scrolled why there's so many dead crossbills <laughs> they grit on the side of the road um so they'll go down to the side of the roads to get um little pieces of sand and then also salt so right now with all the snow on the roads they're coming down and getting all the salt um that they're putting down on the roads and then they're also like fairly tame birds they're not very good flyers um, and they, they're really slow to fly, to flush from the road as well. They're not like, they don't like see a car way off and, and leave. They kind of wait until the car is really close and then fly off. And so it's, yeah, unfortunately they're not, um, very adept with cars. Um, woodpeckers drumming, uh, drumming woodpecker, we do count as singing. You can put that as singing. Um, and that's because their drumming is this big territorial advertisement sound that they're making. So it it um, it acts as the same kind of thing as a singing, like a tanager singing from the treetops. Um, they're doing this big display and so, um, that's what the woodpecker is doing. It's just not using its voice, it's using drumming. So, so we do have them as drumming, as singing. If it's just calling, um, like just doing like a pick call, then, then it would just be that you saw it in the appropriate habitat. Um, for a couple of the, a couple of the woodpeckers, they do have what's called a long call so that like that like woody woodpecker call of pileated woodpeckers um that also functions as a call as a song so those long calls can be recorded as a song as well um 
I'm pretty sure I have all of those examples on the website. Um, I can double check while we're while we're talking. And the the key 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 of flickers, yeah, exactly, yeah, those two. Those long calls are are singing. And, Yeah, the drumming is, is for woodpeckers is mostly territorial. Um, and then Cindy asked, when does the Alice end? Um, at the end of 2024. So it's a total of five years. And then Cindy suggests to have the have screenshots of the the breeding codes with examples on her phone. Yeah, there is um there's a PDF to download and also um the detailed here. Let me just pop this link in the chat here real quick. Let's see chat. All right, so the breeding codes, I put the link in there. Um, so that makes me um, realize. So one of the things that I wanted to show you guys, now let's see if I can get this to work. I wanna try to share my, my iPhone. And I'll show you the app, some of the changes that, happened. All right. Can you guys see that? Yep. Phone. Perfect. Um, all right. So this is the, oops, let me, I need to move something on my screen. Here we go. All right, so I actually have an iPhone. So if it looks slightly different than what you're used to on an Android, it's, it's just because this is the iOS system. Um, but so um, one of the changes that they've made um, is, is with the breeding codes actually. So let me just, I'm just gonna start a checklist and I'm gonna enter two morning doves. Um, so now what you're gonna see if you, click on it and you go to add a breeding code is now these purple dots. Um, so if you've been atlasing for a little while, you probably already know what all these codes stand for. Um, but if you're new to atlasing, it might take a little bit to get used to them. Um, so let me just point out a couple things with the color codes. So this really pale pink or purple pinkish color is flyover. So that's actually not a breeding code. That just means the bird flew directly overhead and, and wasn't interacting with the habitat at all. So it's not breeding. So it'd be like your Canada geese migrating right now. Um, and then this, this light purple here is, um, are the two possible breeding codes. So that's, you know, inappropriate habitat or singing. And then the, the medium purple here are the probable breeding codes. Um, and, and then, oh, interesting. I just noticed that they have the PE as a probable. We count that as confirmed, but different states count it differently. So um, anyways, um, and then the dark, the dark, darkest ones here are the, the confirmed codes. Um, and you'll notice that the, the confirmed codes for New York, at least, all have two letters. So those are your confirmed codes. 
and the two letters are usually the, the first letter of each word. So carrying, nesting, nest building, distraction display, feeding young, carrying food. Um, so on all of the PDFs that I, ooh, oops, hang on. My phone went to sleep. Um, on all the PDFs that I put together for in, in the, the breeding code definitions and stuff, um, I always underline the, the letters that, that um, are used in the abbreviations. So, so you'll notice that there's that little trick. Um, and then if for some reason you don't remember, um, once you click on it, it will tell you, oh, S is for singing bird, and B is nest building. Okay, so there's that little trick as well. So if you're not quite sure, you can click on it and then usually figure it out. So, so it is one change. I don't know. It's, it's quicker for me because I know what all those codes stand for, but other people um, that are just starting out, it might be, it might be harder to, to get going. Um, all right. So let me close that checklist. So the other thing that has changed, so right now I'm in just the core eBird portal. If you go into your settings and I'm gonna change it to the Breeding Bird Atlas, here we go. So now I'm in the Breeding Bird Atlas and now when I'm on the homepage, it tells me right there in the center, it tells me which portal I'm in. So now I can start a checklist. I can enter some, some species here. Um, add a tip mouse and a white breast and a hatch. Okay, and now when I go to stop my checklist, there's also this option right here at the top for which portal you're in. So you can change it. So if you're like, say you're out and you're atlasing and then you're like ah oh, no i didn't i didn't see any breeding behaviors and i crossed like two different block boundaries and i can't be bothered today i just want to go birding um then probably your checklist shouldn't be in the atlas portal and you can just go in and you can change it right back out um so that's kind of a nice little trick now um it's a little bit easier to to change the portal um, all right. And then the other thing that's coming, it's already out on Android um, and it will be out on, on iOS um, probably in the next two weeks, I'm told. Um, there is going to be a, a warning sign telling you, it'll have a little pop-up window that'll show up and say, you're approaching a block boundary do you want to start a new checklist? Um, so that's going to be really helpful too. Um, there may be cases where you're not having good satellite coverage, like GPS satellite coverage. And so it may be like a couple hundred meters off or something, um, but it is just kind of like signaling to you, hey, be aware you're, get, you're approaching a block boundary and, and you may need to, to stop your checklist and start a new one. Um, so those are the, the three um, big changes that are coming for, for the, the uh, mobile app. And then just looking at the last few chat comments here. Oh, and thank you for answering. I don't know territory size and hectares for woodpeckers. So that's very helpful. <laughs> thank you. Um, oh, and Roger's asking, yeah, how do you delete an entry from eBird? I can actually, I mean, I can show you that one. 
and people like the warning, that's great. Here, I'll just show you real quick how to how to delete the checklist because I, I don't need the checklist that I just put on my phone. Okay. All right, so I can go to checklists and I have these two that I just created while we were talking. Um, and you can, yeah, you just swipe and hit delete. At least on iPhone, that's that's how you do it. It's pretty easy. And that's all I have. So I'm happy to answer any other questions. It is a little bit after eight. So if people need to sign off, please feel free to do so. Um, but if you um, have any questions, please feel free to um, either speak up. You can unmute yourself and speak up or um, put it in the chat. So uh, today I had... Um... A cross bill that it, he kept coming out of the same clump of trees and it was the same clump of trees where I saw a male red cross bill do a courtship flight last week um and then at one point there was a hawk that perched nearby a red tail and a crow chased it away and as soon as the crow chased it away and the red tail flew off this cross bill like burst out of the trees and he was just calling like crazy would that be agitated behavior I mean that's what I submitted it as but yeah, I was just checking. I never remember if visiting probable nest site or agitated is higher. Yeah. Code. Um, agitated is the higher code. So yeah, I would do agitated for that, for sure. I hope I find babies they're safe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, somebody asked me how they can check um, which, if they've been assigned the block that they, um, that they signed up for or not. So I can answer that. And then Glenn asked, can you put an eBird checklist into the Atlas portal? Yes, that is very easy to do. Um, let's see here. I can show both of those things. Okay, so let's see if I go to my eBird and go to my checklists. I'm not sure if I have any. So there's now, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but on the, when you're in my eBird, if there's this funny little circle here, it looks kind of like an a billiard ball <laughs> a little bit. Um, that means that it's in a portal. So you can click on it and it tells you, oh, this is in the Breeding Bird Atlas portal. Um, so if I look for one that's not in the portal, I'm not sure. I may have to go too far back here. What I'll do then is I'll show you how to take it out of the portal. It's the same process to put it into the portal. So you can just go to checklist, you go to checklist tool, checklist tools, and you go to change portal. Um, and then from there, you can change it to whatever you want. So the, the generic, like, core eBird portal is just plain old eBird. So we can change it into eBird. And now if we go back to my eBird, and look at my checklists, you'll see that little symbol is gone, showing you that it's no longer in any of the eBird portals. But uh, we can go back to it because I did have some, I had a couple of breeding behaviors this morning. So I do want those in the Atlas. So I'm just gonna change them back into the Atlas here real quick. So, we got that. Um, and then the other question was, how do you check um, 
the block sign up. So that is the same. I, I put the link in the chat, Julie. Great, thank you. I was just gonna do that. Um, so um, the same page that you go to to sign up for a block, um, you can go back to here and then you can zoom into whichever block you're interested in um, and you can click on it um, and see if, if your name shows up as the principal atlaser. Um, so that's how you can tell. Um, Hi, so I'm the one who asked the question. And my the block has said, um, what is it, uh, pending for the last eight or nine months. Oh. So Which, I have block? no idea. Okay. Which um, block is it? Do you know? Not off the top of my head, but it's up in Franklin County. Franklin. Oh, you know, Tom, Tom um, handles that. And he's been traveling all the last, like, I don't know, six months. Um, oh. so let me get someone else to, to look at um, the Franklin County signups. I can ask someone else to do that because he's. I think he's still in Ecuador. Um, okay, that'd be great because... Yeah. I mean, I can report on the block no matter what, but... Yeah, I, it, it's good to know that, that um, somebody has signed up for a block and that way, you know we know that someone's like paying attention to it and trying to get it finished. And it's, yeah, no, it's, it's very helpful. So um, yeah, let me ask, I'll ask somebody else to, to look. All right, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, so Julie, um, this is Glenn Chapman. What yep. I've done is I, I tried one of the checklists on my phone to say, oh, I can switch it out of the eBird portal or the, the Atlasing portal. And then I was like, oh, how do I put it back into it now? <laughs> because I really want it in it. And maybe there's not a way to do it on the phone. On the phone, no. Okay. That's the one thing they, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I wish it was like always an option that you can change the portal, but it's, yeah. Yeah, not, yeah. It's a very new thing and I'm I'm hoping that with the feedback like from you guys that we can we can improve the functionality there um but it is a step forward a small step forward i think <laughs> how do you make a list for a group of people to avoid repetition yeah that's how you, you just share your checklist so you can share your checklist either within the mobile app or um online and what you'll need is the other, the people that you're with, you're gonna to need to know either their eBird username or the email address that they use for eBird. Um, and then there's a section where you can go in and share, um, share checklists. So I can, uh, let's see. Here I can share and then and somebody says they had courtship behavior during feeder watch today. Should you put it in eBird as well? Yes, if you can, that would be great. Um, but just because it's like different portals, different systems. Um, and then there's a good question about um when you're offline so here hang on let me just show you quick how to share checklist so you can go to any checklist and oops that's hiding again um so if your checklist has been shared with someone it will have this little people symbol um so this one isn't this one i did on my own so i can go here um, and you can hit um, this share button. And then um, you can type in, it tells you here either the username or the email address, and you just separate multiple things by commas. Um, and then you just hit this share checklist button and it's good to go. Um, the other person 
um, we'll have to accept the checklist. Um, but, um, but you've done your part in terms of like preventing it from being duplicated that way. That makes sense. Um, sorry, let me stop share. So if you're in a remote area without um, cell service, how do you know a block you're in? <laughs> so within the mobile app, you can see the block boundaries, even if you're offline. However, it's not the, the mobile app doesn't ever tell you the name of the block that you're in. Um, so in order to know the name of the block that you're in, if that's what you're asking, um, you would need to have either um, use use either Avenza or Gaia or um, Google Earth or something like this um, in order and then you would have to download, on the website, there's um, some um, spatial files, uh, KML files that you can put into one of those apps. Um, and then, and those are all free, by the way, all those apps have free versions. Um, and then you can put it in there and then you can actually like click on the block. You can see where you are and click on the block and get the block name. Um, so I do have instructions for that on the website. I guess look at them. Did you want to uh, say something, Julie, about the option of that mentoring survey coming out soon for people that are, are thinking of helping or being helped? Just going back to Erin's question. Um, she she might have missed that option to pick that when she did her blocks. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, we're still um, we're just about ready to announce this new mentorship program. So, for people that um, either want to be mentored by someone or would be willing to mentor someone else who's newer to Alicing, um, we will. Um, announce we're going to send out an email and ask people to sign up for that program and then we'll try to match you up with someone who lives in your area um so that's something that should be coming out in the next month i'd say um so hopefully that program will be in place for for the summer All right, did I miss any other questions? Any other questions? Maybe that's it. Is that it? 